I get up every now and again, you know what, instead of having a free shot to go to different places and it all be disjointed, I thought I'll just have a, a running theme, if you will, through any opportunities that I get to preach here in New Life Baptist Church. And we started two Sunday nights ago with a series entitled Facing Your Giants. We dealt with the giant of covetousness. And uh, for me, this is one of my favorite series to teach through because everything in this world, uh, many things in this world come against us from different angles and different ways. Uh, we think about covetousness two weeks ago. Today, we're going to be thinking about the giant of temptation. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the giant of worry. And there's many different giants that come up against us in our Christian life. Uh, the picture being that of David and Goliath. And obviously, David had that massive fight against Goliath. Uh, a giant that really, humanly speaking, he should never have been able to defeat. And yet he took a sling and five stones and he defeated the Philistine giant, Goliath. For us in our Christian lives, there's giants that's going to come up against us. The inner own strength, humanly speaking, it's going to be nigh on impossible for us to overcome those giants. But as we come to God's word, we see principles and truths there that God is able, more than able to help us overcome in all these different areas of our lives and so we looked at covetousness two weeks ago this morning we want to look at the giant of temptation and i would say this that nearly every one of these messages is applicable to every single person that hears it there's nobody in this room today and i don't know every one of you personally and and know everything about your lives but i know that every single one of us if we're breathing in this world that we deal with that of temptation in our world, there's many different things that come at us from all different angles and all different ways. The devil loves to tempt us. And more than that, his temptation plan is tailor-made for every single one of you. He knows you. He knows your strengths and your weaknesses. He knows what buttons to press. And whenever it comes to temptation, he knows exactly what to tempt you with. This morning, it's going to be quite a heavy message to start with, speaking about the reality of that. But then what I want you to take away more than anything this morning is realizing that although once before we came to know Jesus, we had no real choice in the matter in the sense that there was no spirit living within us to fight the good fight of faith. There was no battle between the flesh and the spirit and we just lived what we wanted and did what we wanted. Now as a Christian, I want you to know this morning that there's no temptation that comes your way in your life that is unconquerable. Amen. As we go through this life, we have principles in God's word that show us that we can overcome any temptation that Satan throws our way. And whenever you leave this place, there's going to be six principles that we're going to look at a little later in the message. Just hit them, give you the verse, give you the principle. I would encourage you to write it down and take those away and meditate on them. Because temptation is a real thing every single day in our Christian life. Like I say, Satan loves to tempt us. We can't underestimate our adversary. We know that he's nowhere near as powerful as Almighty God, but to say that he has no power would be foolish. We come to God's word, and before we get to our main text, here's a few verses for you to think about as we start. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us this about Satan. It says, be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That picture is a, a, a sharp one. It's not talking about some uh, pussy cat or some little puppy. It doesn't describe him in those terms. It says, Satan prowleth around, he's searching as a roaring lion. That's, I don't know about you. I've never come face to face with a lion in my life. And I don't particularly want to in the future. But that's the picture the Bible gives us of Satan. That he's that prowling lion that walketh around and prowleth around seeking whom he may devour. You know what Satan's two goals are? Satan's first goal is that if you're not a Christian this morning. That you would never come to know Jesus as your savior. That's his first purpose. His second purpose is if you come to know Jesus as your savior, is to devour your life spiritually speaking. He wants to take down every single Christian that he can so that God is not as effective as he'd want to be through his people in this world. Satan loves to devour Christians. James adds to this in James chapter 1 verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's where we get the idea of Satan having a tailor-made plan for you. It says you're drawn away, not just by lust, but it says by your own lust. He knows the things that you struggle with. He knows that the thing that he tempts you with might not be what somebody else might be tempted by. He knows what buttons to press. He knows where to hit you and where you're likely to be weak. We're going to look a little later in our message that Satan is crafty. He doesn't do it whenever we're at our sharpest and at our most observant. In fact, he often does it when we're weak. He does it when we're weary. He does it when we're vulnerable because that's just the way that he is. To underestimate him 
would be foolish. We come to the Bible and it tells us there's three main sources that temptation comes from. It talks about the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've talked about the devil, and the devil in many ways uses the other two. Sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, you've got the devil as one source of temptation. You've then got our flesh. And if we're honest with ourselves, I have some people that they come and they ask for prayer and they say, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what Satan's tempting me with. And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes it's not even Satan. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Sometimes we have weaknesses in our own flesh. We we entertain certain things. We go certain places. We do certain things. And it's our flesh, if we're honest, more even than Satan that's tempting us to do that which we know we shouldn't. And then lastly, in that uh, trichotomy, if you will, you see the world. You just have to walk outside these four walls and you realize that there's much in our world that comes at us as Christians to try to help us fall spiritually. The world wants to tear us down in so many ways. In Ephesians 2, verse 2 and 3, we're not going to go there this morning, but it lists all three of those, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it says, such were some of you. And the good news is this morning, because that was all quite heavy to start with, but the good news is this. Ephesians 2 goes on to tell us some wonderful truths. It talks about for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 is there to tell us you as a Christian, you as a child of God, you no longer need to live according to the world of the flesh and the devil. You don't need, no longer need to give in to those things. There's not a fight to be fought. We can fight Satan. We can fight our flesh. And we can fight the world and its standards around us because God has called us to live a holy, set-apart, separated life. And he's given us everything we need to do that. He's given us all that we need to overcome this massive giant of temptation. And so I want to pray for us this morning. Then we're going to get stuck into some truths from God's word as we build a battle plan, if you will, for overcoming temptation in our lives. Let's pray this morning and we'll get stuck into his word. Father God, I want to thank you for our time together today. Thank you for the privilege it is to stand behind the pulpit, to open your word, to preach to your people. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, have me say nothing that you wouldn't have me to say, and help me to say exactly that which you'd want. Help me to decrease that you might increase. May the people here this morning, may we be open, Lord, to hearing your truth. May we not just clock out as many of these truths are familiar truths, but may we take them in. May we apply them to our lives, realizing that Satan is prowling. He's searching. He's that roaring lion trying to devour our lives spiritually. I pray you'd help me this morning as I preach. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We come to our primary text where we're going to be for the most of our morning service. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you look with me, if you have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen there. Verse number 12 through verse number 14. They should be fairly familiar verses to you this morning. God's word tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Very strong words from the Apostle Paul, but I want to take two truths from this text and then we're going to get into the principles. The first thing I want you to think about this morning is this. There's a common experience of temptation. There's a common experience of temptation. What do I mean by that? I mean what it says in verse 13. It says there's no temptation taken you such as is common to man. The good news and the bad news this morning is that everybody is susceptible and a recipient of temptation. There's nobody in this room that can say I've never been tempted in my life nor am I daily tempted. That's the bad news. The good side of the coin is this and I don't know what it is about human nature but We like to know that we're not alone when we go through things, don't we? Whatever I'm suffering, I don't know what it is. It's sort of sadistic in a way. It's like if somebody else is suffering, it kind of makes me happy because I'm not alone in the suffering. If somebody else is in pain and I'm in pain, it's like we're in it together. We can get through this. There's something about human nature, whatever, we're in it together that it makes all the difference. And the church, if you're in here for the first time this morning at New Life Baptist Church, this church is not an art gallery of portraits of perfect people. This place is a building site full of works in progress. We're full of people here that have issues and problems and struggles. And from the front pulpit to the sound booth back there, everybody struggles. There's no perfect people here. 
And temptation is something that visits every single seat in this room. It's a common experience. It's good to know that we're not alone in it. And so you can turn to the people around you and know that they are going through something just as you're going through something. They are tempted just as you're tempted. And while Satan's temptation plan is specific and tailor-made for you, I guarantee you there's nothing new under the sun. That specific thing that Satan tempts you with, I guarantee you that somebody else as a Christian in this world is going through what you're going through. You're not alone in the struggle. You're not alone in the struggle. You're not alone in that temptation. The Bible makes it clear we're not alone in the fight. The truth of the matter is this morning, if you're listening to this message and you say, I have no need for this. I don't struggle with temptation. I, I've pretty much got it figured out. I'm strong enough spiritually. I'm mature enough. I've come along far enough. I don't need this message. May I say this to you if that's your mindset? You are the one that needs it most. You're the one that needs it most. Paul tells us in verse number 12, he says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. If you say this morning, I have no need for this message. I've got it figured out. I'm not tempted by anything. I've, I've overcome it all. I have no struggles, no battles, no trials spiritually. I have got it sorted. Let me tell you this. The higher you think of yourself, the harder, further, and more painful to fall. The higher you think of yourself, the higher, the harder, and the more painful the fall. This message is needful. Needful for all of us because temptation comes our way. It's a common experience. And I can prove it from Scripture. It tells us in the Scriptures that even Jesus was tempted. Jesus is that God man. 100% God. 100% man. If anybody was going to be above temptation, it would be Jesus Christ. But as we see in the Scriptures, you don't have to turn there. It will be on the screen in Hebrews 4.15. It tells us, for we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That verse tells me two things. Temptation is a common thing for everyone. If Jesus was tempted, you can be sure that you will be. But secondly, and this is important to lay this down now. Secondly, that verse tells me that it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was sinless in every way, yet he faced temptation. Being tempted is not sin. Giving in to temptation is. Facing up to Satan's craftiness and all the ways that he tempts us, that's not sin in and of itself. But of course, if we give in to that, it leads to sin. Temptation is exposure to facing what is wrong. Sin is doing that which our temptation tempts us with. And so we see that temptation is a common experience. Secondly, the verses tell us this. Not just is it a common experience, but it says there's a certain escape. There's a certain escape from temptation. Verse 13 tells us there's no temptation taking you, such as is common to man, so it's common. The verse goes on to tell us, but God is faithful. Wonderful, wonderful words. God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. I love those words. God is faithful. In your life, as you go through your week, you can know as a Christian that God is faithful. He's always by your side. He's always there. He always does what he says he'll do. His promises are true. His words are sure. And in this verse, it tells us that he's faithful to provide a way of escape from temptation. It says that there is that way of escape from temptation that will be able to bear it. May I say this this morning? There's no temptation that comes into your life that is 100% unconquerable. There's no temptation that comes into your life that is 100% unconquerable. Every single time temptation comes our way, there is a pre-made way of escape by the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan comes with his temptations. Jesus knows before that even comes, there's a way of escape that he has to provide for you. If you'll but look for it, if you'll seek it out, that way of escape is there in every what temptation that Satan can throw. The original language used there for that word escape is almost like a word picture. That word escape tells us that it's a narrow passageway out of the canyon. A narrow passageway out of the canyon. That's the picture that the original language paints. It's almost like you're surrounded by this canyon of temptation. Satan is pressing in on every side and it feels like there's no way of escape. And maybe that's how you feel this morning. There's some things in your life which time after time you fall, you stumble, you, you do that which you know you ought not. And you give in to that temptation and it feels like you're in a canyon all around you. There's no way of escape. 
That word escape literally paints a picture of saying a narrow passageway out of the canyon. There's always that passageway if we'll look for it. There's always that way of escape from temptation if you're willing to look for it. Maybe you say today, I, fi- I find myself indulging and embracing my temptations often. I find myself defeated by my giants, doing the things which I know I shouldn't. I'm not getting the victory. The good news that you can take away this morning is that it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. There's always a way of escape. The question is, in that moment of temptation, are you looking for it? Are you looking to indulge or are you looking to escape? That's the matter this morning that we want to look at. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 to 14, it lays our foundation for this giant that we're facing. It tells us that it's a common experience. We all face it. It tells us it comes to every man. We've learned that it's not a sin to be tempted, according to Jesus and the scriptures. We see that giving in the temptation, however, is a sin. We then look at the fact that God is faithful. That he provides a way of escape. That there is a way to overcome. That that battle that seems unconquerable, that defeat that keeps coming your way, There's a manner in which we can overcome. And that's where we come to this morning, to the practicalities of the matter. So now we've learned that the giant is there. It's common to us, but there's a certain way of escape. We want to look at some quick principles from God's word, and then we're done this morning, from four big stories in the Bible. Four, in my opinion, four of the biggest temptation stories. Two of these people gave in to their temptation, and two of these people overcame it. We think of the case studies of Eve in the garden. We think of Joseph in Potiphar's house. We think about David on that roof, rooftop as he looked over at Bathsheba. And then we think of Jesus in the wilderness. You probably know those stories very well. The two that give in, we think about Eve in the garden. We think about David on the rooftop. We'll learn from their failure. And then we think about Joseph in Potiphar's house and Jesus in the wilderness. And we're going to learn from their success. There's things that we learn from both success and failure. And we want to take these things away as principles to form a battle plan against the giant of temptation. So the first one is this. You're welcome to write it down if you'd like to. If not, I can send these notes to you afterwards if you'd like them. Maybe you want some bedtime reading to put you to sleep tonight. I can send them over to you. But here's some principles for you to think about in your battle plan to overcome temptation. Number one, hide God's word in your heart. Hide God's word in your heart. One of the most important things when battling temptation, one of the greatest weapons that we have is the word of God. In here is everything that we need to live the Christian life. In here is everything that we need to overcome Satan and his schemes and his plans and his his tempting ways. Everything that we need is here in God's word. If we're going to overcome temptation, it's not just about having a Bible in your house. I'm sure you've got one in your house. It's about ensuring that there's not enough dust on it to where you're not opening it every day. To make sure it's off the shelf and in front of your face and that you're going through it every day and you're taking in the principles. And more than that, it says in Psalm 119, it says in verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Temptation can lead to sin. And it says if we're not going to sin as a Christian, we must strive to hide God's word in our heart. If we're going to overcome sin and overcome temptation, we must hide God's word in our heart. I may say that's more than even just reading God's word. That's meditating upon it. That's memorizing it. That's whenever you're going about your life and whether it's in your workplace or whether it's in your place of leisure, whenever temptation comes, Satan's not going to just tempt you when you've got a Bible sitting in front of you. He's going to try and do it when you don't have that in front of you. Whenever you don't have the Bible in front of you, do you have enough scriptural knowledge that whenever Satan comes tempting, you can say as Jesus did, it is written. Have you hid God's word in your heart where you memorize a battle plan that whenever Satan comes tempting in that area where he knows that you're weak, are you ready to say to Satan when he comes tempting, say, it is written, Satan. It is written in God's word. It says flee fornication. It says flee uh, youthful lust. It says all these different things. Have you memorized the scriptures that you need to form your battle plan? It says, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We see that principle very clearly in one of our four case studies. Jesus in the wilderness, Satan came tempting him. And Satan, like I say, he's crafty and cunning. He came and tempted Jesus when? He came after there was 40 days of fasting. 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days of no food. And he comes to Jesus at the end of that 40 days when Jesus in his his flesh, in his humanity, he's weak, he's weary. And he comes to him whenever he's at his point of greatest weakness. May I say, Satan does exactly the same with you. 
He's not going to come to you after you get out of church on a Sunday morning. Although he may, don't be, uh, whatever you call it, don't be, um, I'm trying to think of the word. Don't be complacent in your Christian life to think that he won't come at any moment. But he loves to come whenever you're, you're point of greatest weakness. And as we come to the scriptures, we see in Matthew 4, this story where Satan comes and he tempts Jesus three times. And you're probably very familiar with this, but Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 Jesus gives his first answer and he says, and he answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Satan, you're coming and tempting me. And my response to you is it is written. Second temptation comes and you'll see a familiar pattern here in verse seven. Jesus says on to him, it is written again, thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. He comes to him that third time in Jesus, familiar pattern now. It says in verse 10, then Jesus says unto him, get thee hence Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Who better to learn from whenever temptation comes than the Lord Jesus Christ? It's more than just four letters on a wristband. What would Jesus do? It's about looking at the scripture, seeing what Jesus did, and then doing it ourselves. Temptation came to Jesus three times in that wilderness. And every time he responded with what? He responded with the scriptures. He said, Satan, it is written. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, uh, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. Do we know the scriptures well enough to overcome Satan whenever he comes tempting at our point of weakness? Whenever the Bible is far from us, it's not in front of us. Do we know the scriptures well enough to say to Satan, it is written? I encourage you, folks, there's no greater practice than meditating upon the scriptures. There's no greater practice than memorizing God's word, hiding it in your heart so that whenever it's not open on a page in front of you, it doesn't matter because it's written upon your heart and you can bring it to memory at any moment. The deeper that you dig into the Bible, the easier it will be to resist temptation when it arises. Let me say that one more time. The deeper you dig into the Bible, the easier it will be to overcome temptation. When it arises. Either we spend time in God's word. And it keeps us from sin. Or we give in to sin. And it keeps us from God's word. Maybe as Jesus did. Hide God's word in our heart. Principle number two is this. Run while you can. Run while you can. I'm sure you can think about. Which of the four stories we're thinking about. When we think about the principle. Run while you can. We think about Joseph. In Potiphar's house. And one of the best things we can do whenever temptation comes our way is to run far away when it arises. Do not entertain it. Do not flirt with it. Do not place yourself deliberately in a position you know might be compromising. As soon as you see that temptation arising, run the other way. And I say that to say this. We know where we're weak. And Satan knows where we're weak. And so you say, well, how can I know how to prepare to run at any given moment? You know what button Satan can press. You know yourself. And I know what I'm like. And I know that I can place myself around certain people or in certain places or in certain circumstances where I'm much more susceptible to temptation. Run while you can. The Bible encourages this. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, it says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. It goes on in chapter 6, verse 18. It says, flee fornication. It goes on in 2 Timothy 2.22. Similar pattern again. It says, uh, flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace. There's a pattern there. To flee. To run the other way. Not to get as close as we can. Not to play and to toy and to entertain and to try and see how close we are. My my dad always likes a joke. So uh, if, if you don't like it, it's his joke. But there was this here scene in Ireland, and you've got Paddy here, because everybody in Ireland's called Paddy. Uh, I met with a person this week, a car dealer, and they said, oh, my son's got an Irish soccer coach. And he goes, what's his name? And she says, his name's Paddy. And I'm like, of course it's Paddy. And so you've got Paddy here, and then you've got Father Murphy, because there's a lot of Murphys in Ireland too. So you've got Paddy, and then you've got Father Murphy. He sees Paddy looking across the room at this young girl, and he sees this smile on Paddy's face, and Murphy comes to Paddy and he says, Paddy, have you been entertaining bad thoughts? And he goes, no, Father, they've been entertaining me. <laughs> so that, I don't know, that's, that's not my joke, that's my dad's. But all that to say is, it's a joke. But how often do we exercise that manner in our Christian life? Instead of, you know, fleeing from it, we entertain it. 
instead of running as far as we can the other way, we get as close to the cliff edge as we can and see how close we can get without falling off. We try to do all those different things whenever the Bible clearly teaches a principle to flee. Whenever temptation comes our way to run the other way, we'll not go into the passage for time's sake, but you know the passage in uh, Genesis 39. You see Joseph there in Potiphar's house. and There's other people around, and the the Bible would intimate that this isn't the first time that Potiphar's wife has tried this because it specifies in this moment that she came this time when there was no other servants in the house. There was nobody else around. And she came to Joseph, and she said, Joseph, lie with me. And he wouldn't lie with her came back the next day and this time she's more forceful and she says Joseph lie with me and she grabs his cloak she grabs his garment and it says in our text there in uh, Genesis chapter 39 it says she caught him by the garment saying lie with me and left his and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out and it came to pass when she saw that she had, had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth and so we see Joseph's response temptation comes He's alone in the house with Potiphar's wife. She comes again and says, lie with me, Joseph. Grabs hold of his cloak and his garment. What does Joseph do? Does he hang around? It says he runs the other way. He flees as fast as he can. He didn't pause, didn't stay there, didn't entertain the thought like old Patty did in her joke. He didn't risk it. He didn't stay in that position of compromise. May I say this morning, folks, especially, and that there is dealing specifically with sexual sin and immorality. That's one of the biggest ways Satan tempts us is both men and women. There's many forms of temptation, but don't mess with it. Don't entertain it. Run the other way. Sometimes we can get into thinking, it's okay, I can handle it. It's all right, sure, I can can cope with the temptation. Let me ask you this. If you tell that to the, the strongest man in the Bible, Samson, and you tell that to the godliest man in the Bible, David, And you tell that to the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon. And I ask you what they all had in common, which way they fell the worst, and which way they sinned the the most obviously, if you will, in Scripture. And all three of them had a problem with sexual sin. You think about Samson, David, Solomon, strongest man, wisest man, godliest man. But they weren't above it, neither are you. And that comes not just in the form of sexual sin, but in every way that we're tempted. You're not above it. You're not spiritual enough, godly enough, or wise enough. That you're not above those things that we just talked about. You're not immune to it. Don't kid yourself. Run the other way. Whether that's a person. Whether that's a place. Whether that's something that you know that is tempting to you. That you know you shouldn't do. Run the other way. Principle number three. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. There's many verses in the Bible that are misquoted. This is probably top ten. Most people, they read this verse and they know the last two parts and they usually forget the first part. They'll usually say, if I was to say, resist the devil, most people would say, and he will flee from you. We know that part of the verse. I've heard many people quote this verse and they miss out the first part entirely because the verse doesn't just say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Because if we're honest with ourselves, us resisting the devil in our own ability and our own strength, it's not going to go so well. We see that throughout the scriptures. People have tried that in their own ability. The verse tells us, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We think about Eve in the garden. Satan came tempting. And she had a choice to make. She could either submit to God and resist the devil. Or she could submit to the devil's tempting and resist God's command. And we see very clearly what she did. She submitted to the devil's tempting. She resisted God's command. And instead of fleeing, she indulged in that which she knew was wrong. May I ask you in your Christian life, are you submitted to God? Are you submitted to him? Are you taking time to put yourself under his power and his authority? Are you looking to him as Lord of your life? And especially in those areas where you know temptation is real, are you laying those before him and asking him, Lord, give me everything that I need to overcome. Help me to submit to you in this area of temptation. Help me then in your strength to resist the devil That whenever the time comes, the devil will go running and the devil will flee. Eve didn't do this. She fell into the trap. She submitted to the devil's tempting. She resisted God's command and she indulged. God asks us, submit to him, resist the devil and he'll flee from us. Number four, and we're quickly moving on. Fourth principle, same from Eve's story. Trust God's goodness. Trust God's goodness. And temptation often, the reason that we give in to temptation oftentimes is because we think that there's something in the temptation that's so good that we're missing out on. 
There's something that temptation can offer me that I don't have right now. It tells us we're missing out. There's something better. There's a better experience. There's something more gratifying that we can take part in. And Satan did just that with Eve. We talked about this two weeks ago. Satan came to Eve and Eve knew not to eat of the tree. And Satan came tempting and said, Hath God said, Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Thou shalt not surely die. And she started to question God's goodness. She started to question whether God was holding out in her. Maybe if I take of this tree, there's something that I can have that's better than what I have right now. And temptation comes to us in our Christian life. And it tries to tell us, God's spoiling your fun. God doesn't know what's best. If you just had this, you'd be satisfied. If you give in to this temptation, you'll be fulfilled. May I say, those are lies from the devil. God knows what's best. God is always God. And he's always good. Especially with his desires for you. He's not holding out on you. There's nothing in those temptations that can offer you anything more or anything greater than what God wants for your life. Temptation always promises us with more. Temptation leads to sin. And I'm sure you've heard the adage that says, sin takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you far, far more than you want to pay. And in the Bible, it says there's pleasure in sin for a season. But friends, there's four seasons in a year. There's one season of pleasure followed by three seasons of sorrow and shame. May we not indulge in Satan's lies. May we not realize, may we not give in to him saying there's more here. If you would just give in, if you just take part in it, if you just go to that place around that person and do that thing. May we not give in to Satan's lies. Trust God's goodness this morning, friends. Number five, and we're coming towards a close. There's just two more and then we're done. Number five, realize that sin is against God. Realize that sin is against God. This is one of the biggest principles that will help you overcome temptation. Realizing that our sin isn't just against a person. It's not against our own flesh. Our sin is against Almighty God in heaven. And there's two stories, one who gave in, one who didn't. David realized it and cried out in tears afterwards. Realizing that his sin was against God. Joseph, in the midst of the temptation when Potiphar's wife was there, realized and said to Potiphar that this sin isn't just against Potiphar and his house. This sin is against Almighty God. And whenever it comes to temptation, one of the greatest things to help us battle and overcome is realizing that temptation is against God himself. Sin always grieves the heart of God. Picture it this way. Sin is the reason that Jesus died. So whenever it comes to giving in to your temptation, I want you to picture this as I do as well. I'm not perfect. I'm preaching to me as much as I'm preaching to you. But every time I give in to my temptation, those nails were there for that reason. Every time I give in to that temptation, that crown of thorns pierced his head for that reason. Every time I give in to my temptation, that cat of nine tails whipped upon the back of our Savior for us giving in to our temptation. May we realize that sin was the reason that Jesus died. And may it encourage us, motivate us, and inspire us. Instead of indulging, to escape that temptation while we can. It ought to motivate us. It ought to inspire us. The two verses that I think about, David writes in Psalm 51. He's writing his his psalm, if you will, of repentance to God. He's committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's murdered Uriah. He's in a bad place spiritually. And he finally gets right. And he says in Psalm 51 verse 4, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou might be justified when thou speakest, and clear when thou judgest. That's how we ought to respond after we fall, although we don't want to. It's against you, God, and you only that we've sinned and done this evil. Joseph did it while it was going on. Psalm, uh, Genesis 39 verse 9. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither is he speaking of Potiphar. Kept anything back from me but thee. But thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The whole verse, Joseph's talking about Potiphar. I'm the greatest in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's kept nothing back from me. You're his wife and he's kept back only you from me. And how can I do this great evil and sin against God? Logic would think he would say Potiphar. The whole verse he's been talking about it. But he says how can I do this great wickedness. And sin against God. We must realize in overcoming temptation. Sin is always against God. When it arises may that help us to overcome. Realizing it's against him. Realizing it's why our savior died. 
realizing it's why those nails and that crown and that whip was applied to his body and why he died on that cross was because he knew that we'd be tempted and he knew in our humanity we couldn't be sinless. He knew that we'd give in. And so that's why he died. And now let that not... Let that not be a reason for complacency. Let us not say, because Jesus died, and because it's paid for, I can do whatever I want. That's, that's not the way we're thinking about this. That's not what the Bible teaches it. It tells us that in spite of all that Jesus has done, if you truly know grace, if you truly know mercy, it shouldn't cause you to be complacent. It should cause you to want all the more to stand up for what is right, to not give in to temptation, and to flee while you can. Lastly, and we come to a close with this, my final thought is this, and then we're done. Pray before the temptation comes. I don't know about you, one of the hardest disciplines as a Christian is your prayer life. It's not something you do by accident. You don't just wake up one morning with head bowed and eye closed, kneeling down beside your bed praying, dear Lord, that, that hasn't happened to me yet. It's something deliberate, it's something that you've got to do. And as we think about temptation, one of the most incredible principles, and we're going to close with this as the invitation as well, is to come to God in prayer. That's why we have our time of invitation, to lay some things down, to ask God to work in our lives, to, to, to kill some things off on the altar. And as we think about prayer, there's a great principle. Jesus lays down the Lord's Prayer, and he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The principle is very simply, pray before temptation arises. How often is our pattern this? We fail to pray. We get into that situation where we're tempted. And as a last gasp rip for escape, we come to God to pray while we're in the midst of the situation. God's word teaches us an incredible principle. Long before the temptation arises, come to him and pray preventatively. That means what that looks like is this. Every single morning when we get up, like I say, you know where you're weak. You know where you're tempted. You know those buttons that Satan can push in your life. Come to God in the morning. Before the situations arise, before the people in your life that come in, uh, before the situations arise in your life, come to God and say, Lord, help me in this moment. Help me on this day, 24th of March, 2019. Help me this day to stand for what is right. Help me this day not to give in to temptation. The battle that I've fought for so long, the battle that every single day, it seems like I can't overcome. Time after time, I stand up to it in my own strength, in that canyon, if you will, in that valley of temptation. And I can't seem to find that narrow way of escape. Lord, please today, help me to find it. Help me to do what's right. Help me to stand for you and your truth. Help me not to give in to that which hurts you and for which my dear Savior died. Maybe today is a time to change the pattern. Instead of getting into situations that are tempting and giving into it and then coming to God afterwards as David did and getting it right. And there's nothing wrong with getting it right afterwards, but how about trying to get it right before? And coming before the temptation comes and saying, Lord, lead me not in the temptation. Help me today to overcome. Some incredible principles as we come to God's word this morning. Six that we've looked at. We've seen hide God's word in your heart. We've seen run while you can. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. We've seen trust God's goodness. We've seen realize that we sin against God. And lastly, pray before temptation arises. A battle plan, friends, to overcome temptation when it comes our way. I want to close this in a word of prayer. And as I close in prayer, I'd ask if you'd stand with me this, this morning as we close in prayer. Heads bowed, nice close. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for our time together this morning. In many ways, it's a sobering message. It's, it's a heavy message, Lord, because temptation is a real thing. The devil is a real adversary. But you're a real God. And in you, we have all the power and all the strength and all the might that we need through you to overcome. As we think about that last principle, Lord, I pray that each of us as Christians, that we wouldn't flirt with temptation. We wouldn't entertain it for even a minute. But that every morning as we get up out of bed, that we come before your throne of grace and ask you to help us. Lead us not into temptation. To help us to overcome. Lord, I pray you'd impart this message upon our hearts and work as you would. For it's in your name we pray. The invitation is simple. Heads bowed, eyes closed. For the next few moments, the altar's open. You're welcome to stay in your seat.